that's uh, Kyle Stelter. I'm the past president of the Wild Sheep Society of BC and our communications chair. Today we're on Talk is Sheep and we're vision, vision number five with, um, today's a, a very cool day. Um, Jared, we got Jared Frazier on with 2% for conservation. Uh, welcome Jared, uh, absolute honor to have you on the, uh, the Zoom today. And uh, we're joined with Ben Barakoff, who's a, uh, uh, many of you in the wild sheep community know Ben. He's a president of uh, Canadian Wildlife Capture and just a fantastic supporter of everything we do conservation-wise. So welcome, Ben. Thanks for- Good morning, guys. How's it going? Great. And Steve up north in Prince George, we're lucky to make this work today with four inches of snow. Steve reached out in a panic this morning saying, we can't do it, we can't do it, there's no power here. So anyway, welcome, Steve. Yeah, power's back on now, but we'll see how that long how long that lasts. So today's a unique one. We've got a helicopter guy, and we've got a conservation company. And uh, so anyone that looks at this on the surface goes, "Where do those two fit in?" And uh, we're going to get to that today. So um, uh, fantastic! Really excited to have you guys both on on board here. Um, so uh, before we jump into the meat and potatoes of two percent and Canadian wildlife capture and what everyone's doing on the landscape for conservation. Um, How's the fall going? You guys getting some hunting in? What's what's happening there? Um, Steve, let's start with you. How did your uh, fall hunt go? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> got, a, got a small black bear in the freezer, uh, rendered down the fat from it. So got about eight quarts of liquid gold. So it's been slow. Haven't really had too much time to get out. And with weather's changing like this, who knows what's, uh, what's going to happen. The good thing is, though, is the deer might start moving soon. So see what happens good good stuff and uh so ben i think you got a story are you able to share with us what you're up to this fall i've, I've been yeah. on social media so right yeah absolutely uh late summer there for the sheep opener stone sheep in bc uh, a good friend of mine andrew walker and i uh we had sort of been planning to get out for a stone sheep hunt for a couple of years and and we're always talking about getting into the right place, trying to get away from people, outfitters, stuff like that. So we came up with a plan about a year ago and, and uh, well, everything sort of came together. We happened to be at the right place, the right time to, to anchor just, a, just at a phenomenal ram, uh, 11 year old, 176 green score uh, stone sheep. And I mean, just from the, right from the planning stage the, to, to getting out there, we plan to, uh, of course, hike our bots off and, and and get into some quality sheep country, and it uh, you know it was everything that a guy could ever imagine. You know, it was the best best time. Good, good, uh, good friendship there with Andrew, longtime friend, and and just a really great guy, and uh, that made it for 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 just an easy hunt. And then we had weather; it was great. You know, we had some little bit of wind, a little bit of rain here and there, lots of mosquitoes, but. Uh, you know, we didn't get stuck in the tent at all. We were out there every single day and we hiked our butts off and, you know, it, it, it was everything a sheep hunt could be because it was a real struggle. You know, we weren't seeing rams everywhere. We weren't uh, finding sheep in every nook and corner. We were struggling to find anything. And then eight days into it, we just stumbled onto two rams and that one that, that we uh, ended up harvesting. And we just happened to be the right place, right time. We didn't even spot it and stalk it. Nope, we were just walking along. Andrew says, hey, there's a caribou running down that far ridge. I put on my binos, I was like, that's a ram. And uh, just then, you know, Andrew's getting out his spot and scope there, and they're, they're moving valleys, so they're moving pretty quick. It came skyline, and right away, I was like, holy man, biggest sheep, you know, either one of us had ever seen in their lives. And, and uh, we managed to get into a good spot, so when he's coming through, we managed to sneak up uh, to 300 yards and he stopped for just long enough to squeeze a shot off, crosswind, probably 30, 40 kilometers an hour, crosswind shot, so I had to aim there a little bit in front of his chest, but just made a, a perfect shot in the end. And uh, yeah, and then it was four days hike out to the lake that we got dropped off at. So it was definitely, uh, it was a grind, but I mean, that's what Stone Sheep Hunt is all about, that's for sure. And, I'd be lucky if we ever saw another sheep uh, in my lifetime that that's sort of the, that sort of class that uh, let alone harvest one. So feeling pretty lucky. Just an all around, just an awesome trip. Right place, right time, great weather. And uh, you know, it all fell into place. That's for sure. Yeah. It was one of those hunts that you just, 
I'm still sort of buzzing and living off that mountain high. Just, uh, yeah, it was great. Well, the cool thing is you earned it too, right? Like you, you had the luck and, uh, you know, to get those two Rams like that, um, kind of just moving, but, but you, you earned it too. It's one thing to get lucky, but it's another thing to, to earn it and then get lucky too. And you kind of get lucky yeah. anyway to kill yeah. a sheep anytime, but, uh, yeah, that's fantastic. Was that your first? That's not your first ram, is it, Ben? No, I harvested a bighorn um, yeah. about five years ago. So that's the second sheep, though. First stone sheep. First stone sheep that I got shot. And I, you know, if that's my last one, I'd still be a uh, die happy man. That's for sure. I mean, it's just great to get out there in sheep country, right? Hiking around. And Andrew and I were talking about that even before we harvested a ram. We're just like, this is, you know, this is as good as it gets. You know, this is. Uh, this is the ultimate place to be and, and just have lots of fun out there. And then to, to come across a rabbit, it was just the icy on the cake. Like, holy cow, boy, did we ever get lucky this trip, buddy? <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I yeah. couldn't think of anyone more deserving, Ben. So fantastic. I know how hard you work and uh, you earned that one. And uh, yeah, just really pleased for you. That's it's such a beautiful ram. So um, yeah. yeah, fantastic. Uh, Jared, over to you. Um, I know you were gone hunting. We were trying to tee up this uh, Zoom cast, and you were busy. You were off on a trip. So, what have you been up to? Uh, my, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> full grown man. <coughs> my fall got uh, wildly derailed. Um, typically, here in the States, when you draw a tag, you've got months to prepare. You find out, you know, in the spring, and you've got until the fall to get ready. Uh, that's not what happened this fall. I, I did draw some fun Montana tags, none of which I have gotten to hunt and their seasons close in like two days. And the reason is I ended up getting drawn for the Grand Teton National Park mountain goat cull on September 1st with the hunt starting on September 30th. Um, I'm... <laughs> Still, similar to Ben, still kind of riding that. Uh, we've been out a week. Uh, it was insane from start to finish. When we were first talking, you were asking some questions, and I, I was just being honest. I said, I don't know if I can talk about this, that, or even if afterwards, if I'll be even able to show pictures. Um, stuff like this in a national park doesn't typically happen down here in the lower 48. Up in Alaska, there is hunting in national parks uh, from time to time, but down here, it doesn't happen. And the circumstances around this uh, were pretty wild, fairly controversial, um, and we could probably do a whole Zoom meeting just on the history of that. Um, Cliff Notes version, though, basically about 40 years ago, some mountain goats were introduced just south of the Grand Tetons, um, well, the Grand, Grand Teton National Park. With uh, the intent to have some tags to raise some money with Wyoming Fish and Game, uh, maybe they'd move over to Idaho, it'd be good for Idaho too, because it's right on the border there between Wyoming and Idaho. And that happened. Um, the biologist that was monitoring the area, well, the team, but the main one in particular, noted that they had a couple strains of bacteria that were pneumonia causing, about five of them, actually, uh, not just a Moby, but a bunch of others. And they were warning, saying, if these things get into the park, we're going to have a little bit of a problem. And this is like when I was born, they were saying this. Well, uh, flash forward to 2009 the first nanny with a kid is seen inside the park at the south end so 11 years ago now there's over 150 of them what was going on inside the park and people go okay well that's you know that's nature well first off someone introduced those goats just outside of the park so that's not nature at that point but inside the park was one of the most genetically unique bighorn uh, populations, Rocky Mountain Bighorn, that we have here in the Yellowstone ecosystem. It's some of the oldest genetics, too. And it was a pretty big population. If you go back and read, like, first summits of some of these mountains, because the Tetons are mountaineering mountains, kind of first and foremost as far as use. If you read some of the early summits from, like, 1918, they're trying to figure out routes up by talking to bighorn sheep hunters. There were so many bighorn sheep in there. Uh, and, and quality bighorn sheep populations. It was a popular destination for hunting. 
the unit immediately outside the park on, on the west side, so on the Idaho side, was also that. And then numbers just started dropping off. In the early 2000s, sheep numbers just, sheep started disappearing. Uh, so the biologists were trying to figure out what's going on. Inside the park, they're trying to figure out what's going on. And our politics around our parks and, and the bureaucracy around our parks are probably not that far off from yours. A lot of stuff is kept very siloed. Um, like Wyoming Game and Fish not sharing data with the National Park Service and vice versa. So 2009, one nanny, one kid. Flash forward 2020, and there's over 150 of them and the sheep are almost non-existent. You can't find them hardly anywhere. There are still sheep, but they're not anywhere that you would have seen them. And there's a real push to try to protect this very genetically unique population of bighorns. So last year, the park sent in a helicopter gunner to just do a straight call. And their reasoning, uh, no one <laughs> really agreed with that at the time, including myself. I say no one, but especially hunters didn't agree with it. Um, the terrain just being too difficult is, was, was the, the, the reasoning. Uh, we can't uh, translocate them uh, because, you know, the, the terrain. And a lot of us were like, yeah, whatever. Uh, we feel like we could. Uh, so they sent in a helicopter, and in a day, he took out 38 of them out of that 150 or so. That was this past pre-COVID winter. Uh, then uh, the governor of Wyoming blocked it, said no more. Uh, Wyoming legislature blocked it. Wyoming Fish and Game said we're not going to allow this because of wanton waste rules, which, again, I, I am not down with shooting and leaving something in the field, not typically. Um, I, I actively work against that <laughs> as my day job. Uh, so they said, let's do a, a, a lottery. So I got a call from the Wyoming Wildlife Federation. One of our board members, actually, Jess Johnson, she said, you should put in for this. So I built a team of 2% members, uh, our 2% member coordinator, Calvin uh, Farinato as well, was on the team and myself. And I just thought, you know, the draw odds are going to be awful. I'm not going to draw this thing. And September 1st, I open up my inbox and it says, you've been selected. What happened after that was very aggressive background checks, hardly any information out of the park. So again, typically you're planning for a goat hunt. You want to know what's the density, where in my unit should I get? Typically you can talk to a biologist. In this case, we had to go through two and a half weeks of aggressive background checks of our, our like anything with like felonies, misdemeanors, but then also any wildlife violations when we were like two years old, stuff like that. Um, and one of our team members did end up having one from way, 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 way back on their very first hunt. They were missing a $10 stamp that they didn't know that they had to have in addition to the tag they bought. And they, you know, they had it rectified and the warden had said, sorry, I shouldn't. Have. Anyway, we got all that cleared and it's two weeks out and we find out we can actually go in. And then we also find out you can only hunt with copper, which I normally only hunt with copper anyway. Uh, I work with a volunteer with the Raptor Center here. I've seen the stuff. I typically only hunt with copper because I can, but I'm also not making uh, poke shots like what you're going to make in terrain like that. Um, so we have to find copper is, is the one fun thing because we have to take a shooting test. So we find all the copper. We get the gear. We start hearing back from the biologist where these, where these goats are. Then we go down there. Um, and I, I think the day that you called about this, uh, or emailed about this, we had just lost one of our team members. He had a family health emergency and he was like primary shooter. So scrambling two days beforehand, we get down there, we take the shooting test, we do the orientation, we look at all the science and stuff. And one thing they really like pound into our heads was if you get attacked in a national park and you have a rifle and you're attacked by a moose or a grizzly, if you use that rifle or don't use that rifle, don't use bear spray, your life is over. And we're like, what do, what do they mean by that? Like, this is Todd. Todd used to run a successful real estate business. Todd self-defense to grizzly bear in a national park. Todd now runs an Arby's. Like, it, it was, you know, warning us what would happen to our careers. So there was bear spray training and stuff like that. Um, 
we find out that we're not allowed to hike in the drainage uh, or, or camp in this certain vicinity of the area that we were supposed to operate in. Um, at, we, we weren't supposed to be in there at night. And we had heard that this canyon was like trying to hike through a pile of hash browns, that you might touch the ground every 45 minutes or so. Uh, and also that it will take you three hours to go one mile because of how thick the, I mean, it's just thick stuff apparently. And we're like, whatever, we can, we can do, we're mountain people. We can do this stuff. So we do a four and a half mile canoe trip in. First off, whose goat hunt starts with a canoe paddle? Like, do a four and a half mile canoe trip in. And then once we find our camp, uh, where we're allowed to camp, which was a gorgeous place, um, then we realize we have to canoe a mile and a half every morning just to get to the base of the canyon to then do this three hour uh, per mile climb through alders and stuff. We, do, we, we get all set up, we do that over the course of the next few days. I won't give the whole story, but over the course of the next few days, we end up hobbling out one team member who stepped on a, on a branch and their ankle was louder than the branch. Uh, and that was the first day in there. Uh, not getting out until about midnight in some of the thickest grizz country in the Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, the next day, oh, we also had a, a grizz encounter that day. Um, didn't involve bear spray, thankfully, uh, because the team member was alone when it happened. The next day, we ended up uh, bear spraying a moose that charged into our glassing area. Um, I, I discovered I can turn coal into diamonds. The pucker factor was real, real high with that. Uh, one of our board members nearly got trampled. Uh, it ended up stepping on her cell phone and just like folding it. Um, it got sprayed by another one of our board members and then myself as it came through, bumped into our photographer on the way out and trampled a bunch of gear. Uh, and that was a spot where we were going to try to set up a spike camp closer to the goats that we had found. Uh, the next day, what happened? Oh, so the next day, uh, we, we take some, we finally get to shoot at the goats. And this is the first time this is being said publicly. So, um, I love hunting with copper it doesn't work so hot at angle at range. So at range, I had, I had practiced out to distances I normally don't hunt at because I've been warned that might be the shot you have to take just because of the terrain. I did not practice at angle. And our shots just ended up consistently landing low. We ended up not getting a, a nanny, which is what they had asked us to go after. They wanted nannies killed more than billies, more than anything else to stop them from reproducing. We, we couldn't get any closer either because the nannies are smart, as you all know, and they set up on this benched area that had only one little chute that you could get to unless you rappelled down from above, which would require about a day and a half of technical spine climbing to get to that rappel point, or you would have to technical climb and hope she didn't hear you coming up the other side. So we were very limited. But when we took those shots, we ended up causing a rock slide on the talus field in the canyon behind us which is where that board member that we nearly killed the day before with the moose was sitting and glassing. And she had boulders the size of Volkswagens flying around her. Um, so that's how that hunt went on, on the personal front, like goats, they're my favorite species. I do love sheep. Um, caribou is probably close second from a conservation perspective and things I'm super passionate about, but like I'm a life member of the Goat Alliance. Um, I've volunteered on several goat surveys. The idea of going in and just wiping out a population of them hurts naturally. Um, but I know what they're doing in there. And I know what they're doing to the sheep population. They're not native to there. No one wants them. Uh, no, no other parks, no other mountain range ranges want them because nearly all of them have been, or a huge percentage, I should say, have been testing positive for, you know, bacteria and diseases that aren't wanted uh, anywhere. <laughs> uh, and trying to net cannon them would just be the most expensive way to kill them. Uh, uh, the quote was basically $20,000 to kill a goat. You know, if you try to net cannon them out of that terrain. It's some of the most rugged, nasty country I've ever hunted in. Um, but I'm thankful for the experience. I would do it again. 
uh, but give me about a month to recuperate and get my joints back to normal <laughs> before <laughs> giving that a step. We have a couple other, there's a 2% member in that same canyon right now um, trying to get the nannies that we were at. We gave them all the beta. The bear spray is off of the ground where we had deployed it on that moose so they can actually camp in that spot. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But every, every element of it was cranked to 11. The PR, the controversy, the misinformation. There were like four podcasts that came out in the hunting world that just had tons of misinformation about it. So we're going to try to do our part to get the, you know, the facts out there so that folks understand what this was about. All in all, weirdest hunt I've been on, hardest hunt I've been on, um, and definitely weirdest volunteering because technically we're park volunteers. Um, weirdest volunteering thing I've done for conservation in my life. Wow, that's a, that's a fantastic story. Yeah, it just goes to show you that, you know, conservation's nuanced, right? It's not cut and dry. Yeah. Um, you know, this really isn't, you know, when you look at from the goat side of things, you know, is this a conservation uh, success story? Yeah. It's super controversial, right? But uh, I appreciate you being candid on it. Um, do, you, do you know if there's been much success? Like, I know they... They wanted to reduce those numbers. And I think you guys didn't have a bag limit either. You could shoot more than one, right, on that, it's from what I understand? Yes, the rules, the rules were each shooter um, – there wasn't a limit on what a shooter could shoot, put it that way. So each team could have up to three shooters uh, and up to one helper per shooter go in. So we were supposed to have a team of six. We ended up with a team of five, uh, three of us shooting. Um, you, there was no bag limit. However, there was a bag limit on what you could personally take home. So because of some very strict and put in for very good reasons, uh, very good conservation reasons, uh, laws at a federal level that would take an act of Congress to change, uh, which if you know anything about our Congress at any point in our nation's history is not a quick moving thing. Um, no skulls or hides may be taken out, uh, period. However, the meat could go home with basically everything except for the skull. And so our, our team, we're all, we like to eat everything. So we're like, well, what about the cheek meat? What about the tongue? You know, in, the, in, the, in the orientation, the other teams are looking at us. Um, <laughs> but uh, you, you're not allowed to take out anything that might be considered a trophy commodity because there were problems uh, for a long time. When, when our parks were put into place, there were some of the first – places where we started rehabilitating species in the country. It was easiest to regulate these small areas. So it was made very hard to change that. But because of an act called the Dingle Act, which is the same guy who created the excise tax on uh, fishing uh, equipment that goes to conservation here in the States, uh, uh, volunteers are allowed to take out meat and allowed to shoot in the park. So we would have each been allowed to take out the equivalent of one goat worth of meat and then any other goats that we shot and were able to retrieve, we could donate to the local food bank. Um, that said, to answer the first question, when we got out, a total of, I believe 14 goats had been shot over a month by dozens and dozens and dozens of hunters going in and and take that compared to you know 38 shot in a day uh via helicopter so if, if from an objectives perspective this is nowhere near as efficient my main concern though after being in there and experiencing what we did is the risk that is put on the public perception of hunters by having folks operate in there um if that moose had trampled Jess or Craig, Sam, when she sprayed, I mean, she nerves of steel. She just stood straight still and sprayed it just a few feet from her as it, um, you know, if it, had, if it had trampled any one of us, that would have been in the local paper uh, because injuries in the park are public information. Uh, if we had, and I had my hand on the bear spray and my other hand was trying to get my rifle out of my backpack. It happened super fast. So it was, you know, the moose was there and then it was coming through. Um, if I had had to do that, like if he had stuck around and decided he wanted to punk each one of us, that would have not just been bad for myself for 2%, but hunting culture in general, mm -hmm. um, and, and perception of hunters here in the States and, and everywhere else. So from a risk for hunters, even 
operating in there in the fall uh, when the moose are running, when the elk are running, when the grizz are desperately trying, you know, especially because they're so heavily populated in that area. Uh, the grizz we saw were all just way skinnier than they need to be right now, typically because they're competing with each other so much. Um, any interaction like that, it's not the park that comes out looking bad. Mm -hmm. It's hunter. So from that perspective, I, I came out the other end and our whole team did too. Um, if, if we're going to do this and we believe we need to do this, the helicopter is probably the best choice from a, all sides. So you envision that's where it's probably headed. Uh, that there'll be a likely a call um, in the, in the future. Cause I know there's a lot of controversy governors involved, obviously. And, and yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's hunting groups involved too, uh, who would love to see high dollar tags, like let someone fly in that helicopter for 10 grand and be the one to pull the trigger, not understanding what it takes to be a, you know, a, a cull shooter in a helicopter. Um, there's a lot of controversy around it, but if we're going to get it done, it really should be done the best way. Cause ultimately every, every hour, They're still competing with the sheep. They're still on the landscape, spreading the bacteria with the sheep. Uh, as of right now, two of the back, two of the five bacteria strains have been found in the local sheep herd that is remaining. In in the remnants of the herd that was, uh, two of those bacteria strains are in there now. So the only way to save this genetically unique group is to remove the goats. And I mean, this isn't working. It, it's and we're all capable hunters those of us who were in there the other shooters that were in there there was another team that shot four but they were shooting over a thousand yards wow. from like 20 pound tripods that they bolted to the ground um the one shot was 1240 hmm. uh so convert that to meters you know that's a that's a shot that's a serious serious shooting skill to do that uh and they did not retrieve uh, they just left them up there because there was no, uh, by again, without repelling from a helicopter, some of these spots you, you truly can't get into. So. Well, yeah, fascinating. Heavy. Definitely. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a tough one, right? And uh, great to hear your perspective on it. An interesting six people and no animals, right? So um, I just attest to the country. Right? I, I've been in the park there and it, yeah, it's literally, it just does this the whole time, right? So. And it's, it's not scalable. It's not, I mean, there, obviously there are parts that are, that's why it's a mountaineering destination, but that's where Himalayan climbers come to train and to train on stuff harder than what they typically encounter in the Himalayas. So let's send some rifles in there and tell you to pack out a goat. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And we'll throw some uh, crazed grizzly bears and moose while we're at it just for, just for. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. And a daily canoe ride. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic okay well we'll leave that you're right that this is a full podcast in itself uh, or a zoom cast uh, talking about this uh uh this goat hunt slash call so uh but uh, appreciate your perspective on it for sure jared and um yeah we'll we'll maybe revisit that at some other time but uh, so uh the connection we've got ben on here uh ben's president of canadian wildlife capture and we're going to talk about the company shortly um jared um, you, both you gentlemen have a uh, a strong conservation ethic uh, you guys have done a lot of work in the conservation community. So, um, you know, maybe Ben, we'll start with you. I'd just like to hear kind of your perspective, um, you know, how you got into, um, I, I guess, hunting, conservation, that sort of work, and, and you know, what, what drives you on the conservation side of things. Right, yeah. Um, I grew up in a, a family where we, we hunted, ate pretty much, our only red meat was game meat. Um, and grew up just outside. I uh, grew up in the East Coutines in British Columbia and Cranbrook. And uh, we spent uh, every spare moment outside, um, whether it was camping, hunting, picking berries, picking mushrooms, uh, or outdoor recreation stuff as well. And so I guess, I guess that's where I got my love of hunting and passion for the outdoors. Um, but fast forward to um, my adult, life uh, i got into helicopters I, I don't really know how i got into helicopters but it was mostly i'm not really a pilot that's that's one thing i just like being out in the bush and helicopters seem like the ultimate tool 
to get out to the most remote areas and to be outside every day and doing something different every day. And, and that's, I think, what, what sort of drove me to get my pilot's license and on and on. And so I, I, I just worked as a helicopter pilot um, since 2001 is when I got my license that I got going right away and, and did that till maybe 2008, I guess, somewhere along there. And I always sort of had in the back of my mind, you know, I knew about wildlife captures well, and, and putting out GPS collars and, and different wildlife helicopter uh, operations and surveys. So I started getting kind of interested in that and I was doing some survey work and that's where I, I ran actually I met up with Andrew Walker and that was actually through our wives and through our kids is how I met him and he kind of he, he proposed or didn't propose the idea but he sort of brought it up and he said man you got a you got thousands and thousands of hours in the Hughes 500 which is the ultimate capture helicopter he's like how come you're not out there catching animals and you know I, yeah I kind of like to do that one day and he said well yeah, I think you should do that and so I pursued it with some other people and and um, and quickly realized, yeah, if I was going to do it, I got to do it by myself. And so that's when I started Canadian Wildlife Capture. That was in 2012. And then it's just evolved from there. And the more that I work with the different biologists uh, and and different conservation groups, I I realized these guys are passionate people and all for the same cause. And the biologists and everybody out there, the biologists have a tough go at it. They uh, are often single or uh, like single operations, just themselves. They'll be in an office. You know, they might have five managers, but them themselves are, are the only person working out of the, um, the office in their different regions. That's in British Columbia. Maybe in other places, it's a little bit different. Alberta is much the same. Saskatchewan, it's even fewer when you get out sort of into the prairie provinces here in Canada. Um, but these guys have a tough go. They're pretty much contract managers. <laughs> and then they're, the biology is, is sort of like the last thing on there uh, that they're able to do. They, they got a big task out there. And so I think as I work more with them, I realize, man, these guys, these guys just really need, they need help to get the job done. Especially here, like see that, especially here in, in British Columbia. And of course, with the conservation groups, here's a bunch of people um, you know, especially wild sheep side people, truly passionate, and they're putting their uh, their boots to the ground and doing what they can. And and to me, that's uh, uh, that's admirable. So as far as anything, I, I try and do whatever I can to help out. You know, use what my background, my experience, and my expertise into um, to helping out as much as I can. And as far as the two percent for conservation. Uh, I got introduced uh, to Jared, uh, La, I guess it was 2019 at the Jurassic Classic, and I had actually never heard of it before, but um, it's just one more group. It's one more initiative, I guess, and a, a good people doing good things, right? That's what it's all about, and it's, it's, it's so important in today's age, in 2020. Look where we've come over the last 100 years. Um, and lots of times I look down to the United States, you know, the United States got a higher density of people, the smaller land base, you know what, that's going to happen here in Canada as well. And so I look at the, where they're at with their initiatives, whether it's Rock Mountain Elk Foundation, uh, Wild Sheep Foundation, what are they trying to do? They're trying to set aside lands for public use, for wildlife conservation. Um, you know, where can we start in Canada? Uh, to do stuff like that or what can we do locally to help get on that to get our foot in the door today and and I'm I'm all part of uh, doing whatever I can to get there that's for sure get that start going well we sure appreciate it Ben and uh, you know you really have set an example in the conservation community certainly uh, in in the circles that I run um, so Ben is uh, Canadian Wildlife Capture is a 2% certified company and we're going to talk about what that is. Jared's going to do the deep dive on that. So you're 2% certified. I think one of the first Canadian companies uh, to become 2% uh, certified. So, um, and I know you're a huge supporter of the society, the Wild Sheep Society of BC in our work. Um, uh, in 2019 at that Jurassic Classic, we gave you the Wild Sheep Friendly Award, which is the first time we've done that. 
um, you've been a huge partner with us uh, on a number of projects. Uh, and I know that with the uh, Fraser River project in Region 3, uh, with the Fraser River Bighorns, um, you made a sizable contribution in terms of uh, uh, making that project happen for us. So, uh, you know, we're so thankful, Ben, for all, all that you've done. And, and you've, you've shown up on the radar and you're just always there supporting uh, just on so many different levels. And uh, so we, we can't thank you enough for all you've done. So we're going to come back to you because I want to hear about, um, about the 2% process from your, the, your lens and how you've seen it um, and talk about that and some of the other projects that you're supporting. So, so that's the tie-in. That's where the helicopter company and 2%, that's the tie-in. So Ben's 2% um, certified through Canadian Wildlife Capture. So fantastic work. So let's just um, jump over to you, Jared. And if you, if you could talk a little bit about your conservation footprint and, and what got you to where you are and, and how you got Two uh, percent is a very unique company. I want to talk about that shortly, but I want to hear about your story first before we go there. Well, similar to to Ben, uh, I think my first not red meat burger. I, I remember my first Big Mac. Uh, you know, from McDonald's. I was I think eight years old. Prior to that, it was wild game, uh, and I thought everyone grew up that way. Uh, we we were in a super poor part of northern Wisconsin. So I uh, grew up uh, hunting and fishing. I actually quit hunting and fishing though for six years. Uh, I, I moved out of my parents when I was 16 and uh, something passionate of mine, uh, a, a, a passion of mine is is trying to retain hunters. Uh, I, I had quit hunting because I was moving so much and it, it was not it was cost prohibitive to try to buy out of state tags when you're a 17 year old living out of your car. Um, so, <laughs> uh, it, it, it was a, it was a bit of a hiatus for me, but, uh, a big impetus for having uh, gotten back into it as an adult was my kids, uh, moving out to Montana, uh, back in 07. I've, I've now lived out here about a third of my life, a little more than a third of my life. Um, having all this wild space. Uh, ben mentioned, you know, just looking at the high population, you know, and, and less land to work with. That's what I grew up with in northern Wisconsin. If you didn't own land, good luck hunting in the pumpkin forest in the fall. You know, you hop up in the tree, the, you know, the sun comes up and you just see orange in other trees, hunter orange everywhere around you. Um, came out here and there's all these opportunities. So that started getting me back into it. A strong ethic in it had been built into me from my parents. My mom's super into birding. Uh, she wouldn't call it that. She'd call it having bird feeders, but super passionate in, into that. And my dad actually, uh, when I was six, built a trout hatchery out of like a horse trough uh, with the Wisconsin Department of uh, Natural Resources. And, and we were helping rehabilitate trout. Uh, as a kid, but we didn't call it conservation. We just called it, you know, helping fish and stuff. Uh, but out here, I started volunteering with different groups uh, that I saw working on things that were pretty pressing. So uh, like Ben mentioned, the Elk Foundation, I became a life member of them as soon as I could uh, when I was running my own business and whatnot and volunteering on their stuff with, with my kids. The uh, first elk that I shot was on a, a migration route towards a area that they had helped rehabilitate uh, my first bull that I shot same thing migrating to an area they'd helped rehabilitate um, and volunteering with them uh, kind of gateway drugged me into volunteering with lots of other groups and then in 2017 uh, I get a call from uh, Randy Newberg uh, whom you all may know he has a TV show on Amazon he's also 2% certified now as his, his show Fresh Tracks is um, he said hey you need to show up for an interview and at the time I was running a web design graphic design marketing company I'd started up because the recession hit and no one wanted outdoor educators under the age of 50 um, so I had learned how to code and stuff and had been doing that. So I assumed I was applying for some marketing gig and I showed up and it was the executive director position for 2%. And a week later I was trying to figure out how to shutter my business and live on significantly less running a startup less than a year old conservation group. Uh, but the, the thing that you know really made me want to do that is what I've been doing in those conservation groups I was volunteering on with uh, either in committees or just general member of boards 
um, was I was always trying to partner businesses with the causes because there were small causes that people never heard about. And then a business would show up and donate, you know, backpacks or donate. Uh, they'd have a bunch of their, their employees show up and do a big trail project or remove barbed wire fence or something like that. And suddenly that organization would be known. And that was something I'd seen replicated over and over and over again. Uh, and just was a big passion of mine. So making that pivot over, seeing that as maybe the easiest way to start tackling some of the, some of the things that are falling through the cracks, like caribou, uh, like mule deer migration. A lot of these things, we're going to have to probably look at private industry because even down here in the States where we have several tax programs, it's nowhere near enough for what we need to do. Um, there's way more work than what our different tax acts here in the state can provide. And you, once you get outside of countries that have uh, excise tax programs like that, as you all know, um, then you're very much depending on private dollars and private time. Um, back to that goat hunt, they threw something up on the screen while we were there. I took a screenshot of it. Grand Teton National Park saves over $10 million a year because they use volunteers for different things that otherwise, if they were to do contractors, um, you know, they, they'd have to pay for. And that goes for so many things in conservation. If you can have a company show up with their skid steer or their helicopter um, and even provide it at a moderate discount, it can have a huge outweighed impact uh, compared to if we were to try to go about it other means. So uh, that, that stuff all just kind of cascaded very quickly uh, into me running 2% and trying to figure out how to start up a conservation nonprofit um, that is weird uh, and not your normal kind of nonprofit. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think weird is a, a great word for it. That's not the word I, I use. <laughs> the word is very diverse, right? Uh, you got uh, people on there like uh, Jeff Spazito, uh, president of Stone Glacier. You got uh, Jess Bronson uh, out of Wyoming uh, Wildlife Federation. Um, you got uh, Dan Johnson. You got all these different um, directors that uh, you know. Pretty impressive to be to be frank. So um, and um, and then you know Randy. There's that Randy story which I love hearing. That I was I was going to ask you about it. I, I love hearing that story about Randy called you up and and uh, basically put you there. So. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so, um, you know, it is a unique organization and, and unlike anything I'm familiar with, um, uh, and it, it's a great story. So can you tell us, you know, what 2% is? Uh, there's a lot of people that will be listening that don't know anything about 2%. So what do you guys do? What's yep. your, how does it work? So our, our main program uh, is, is really spun out of our mission. And, and our mission is to create an alliance of businesses and individuals that ensure a future for hunting and angling by giving their time and dollars to fish and wildlife conservation. Long but simple. Uh, and our, our main program is the certification. So we have a, a business side to this certification and an individual side. And essentially they work the same way, but the business one has like proper paperwork that has to happen with it. What we what two percent is is one percent of your time and one percent of your dollars over the course of a year. So one percent of your time, if you work a forty-hour work week, which most of us work significantly more than that anymore, um, if you work a forty-hour work week, that would be about twenty-one, twenty-two hours a year that you would donate to fish and wildlife conservation efforts. We don't tell you where to put those those uh, hours, whether you're an individual or a business. We don't say it has to be with this group or that group or in this way or that way. It can mean a lot of different things. And it does mean a lot of different things across our member base. We've got folks who hit all 21 hours, just like serving coffee at volunteer events. You know, they are supporting the other folks doing the, you know, on the ground sexy work. Um, we have some folks who do it using uh, their platforms, whether it be social media, podcasts, uh, we have folks who hit it by going to public meetings, every single public meeting that may involve something that they're passionate about. We count, I mean, if you think about where you could put your, your, your time, uh, it's pretty limitless and up to your imagination and how it could help wildlife. Uh, on the dollar side, it's 1% of your gross income or gross sales. So 
if, if your gross income, you know, here in the States, the average is about $50,000. That's $500 over the course of the year. And that might sound like a lot, but what we count towards that is you go to a pint night, which COVID year isn't really happening that much. Uh, let's say you go to a pint night fundraiser, those beers that you buy while you're there, that all the money goes to that conservation group. So that you're literally getting certified for drinking at that point. Um, not that you should, but you know, if it's for conservation, we'll, we'll, we'll make some exceptions. Uh, if you buy a, a banquet uh, a ticket, you buy um, a table uh, for your family or your business at a banquet, uh, any booth you may have at a, at a fundraiser, uh, and then any donation of product, any donation of services. Uh, when we've got some artists who donate their art to then be put up for online auctions, especially this year with COVID, we've had many doing that. We've had folks tying flies that they would normally sell for quite a bit that they're donating to conservation groups for online auctions this year. And then of course, cash donations in the form of like membership. Someone buys a membership to the Wild Sheep Society of BC. We would count that. Someone, um, you know, buys something at auction at one of those. So not only the person donating it, but then the person who buys something at that event or from the group, we would count that. So again, super, you know, super huge amount of options that you have for where those dollars can go. Um, you know, anytime someone provides a discount, we count that discount off their normal uh, cost for doing it. So for businesses, I'll get to the paperwork thing here in a second, uh, but for individuals, we were looking at how do we make this attainable for anyone living anywhere? You know, uh, we, we had someone reach out. It was prior to me being hired on. There was an email in the inbox, someone from Trinidad, uh, you know, how do I become a member? I don't think I'm allowed to send my financials internationally. So what we decided uh, right from the get-go, Jeff Spazito, who started us uh, back when he was at Sitka Gear, um, decided early on for individuals we were going to make it an honor system. So uh, we've, we've got a, a, a slogan, conservation karma is real. Uh, if you lie about it, you'll probably get Lyme's disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, dengue fever, and all that kind of stuff, and, and eat tag soup for the rest of your life. But the reason why we made it honor system is so that literally a kid living in some country far away from the States uh, could make the commitment to give 1% of their time and dollars. And we do have kids uh, outside the U.S. who are certified. People of all all stripes uh, that make the commitment in their personal lives to give their time and dollars. So there's no sending us your tax returns. There's no, here's where all my hours went. Um, so that's the individual side and it's free. That's another thing. We try to keep things here at 2% super lean. We work from home offices and probably always will. I, I won't promise that, but more than likely, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be trying to keep those costs down. Uh, because we want to see dollars going to conservation causes like the Sheep Society and, and Goat Alliance and, and, and others. So individual members are free. Uh, business members, we do have to do the paperwork. So otherwise it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't mean much, right? If when a business said that, hey, we're certified, where's your proof? Well, we didn't have to give it. Um, for businesses, there is the, the requirement of proof. So when a business first comes on with us, uh, we let them commit to the coming year. They can put in their application where they intend to give at least 1% of their gross sales in at least uh, 21 hours. We don't require that every employee uh, give 1% of their time, just the equivalent of one employee's time that can be spread across the company. And the reason why we do that, we have businesses with over you know 300 employees. Just to keep track of that, they'd be paying somebody to keep track of those hours. And at that point, that's money not going to boots on the ground conservation work. So instead, we ask that they use those 21 hours in a way that is unique to them, special to them, that they can fit either locally or within their industry to make the most impact. We don't force them to do that. If they decide to go and clean up trash for you know, a couple hours every week, that's, that's fine. And we do have business members that do that. Then we have others that fly to DC uh, like two years ago, uh, Mountain Ops and Sitka Gear flew to Washington, D.C. with the Wild Sheep Foundation and advocated uh, for wild sheep. They got a meeting with the Department of the Interior that some of our other business members would never get. And we have other business members like breweries and, and coffee companies that get meetings with the local water uh, conservation district advocating for clean water because their businesses need it. 
uh, but also because they're avid anglers. Uh, and that's meeting that Sitka and Mountain Ops they'd never get. So we don't force them to do it one way or another, but we do encourage that. On the dollar side, like I said, it could be any discounts, any donation of services in any way, shape, or form, uh, direct donation. It just has to be at least 1% of gross sales going to something in fish and wildlife conservation, going to increasing access, because if people don't have access, they won't care. Uh, if you look at how things get voted on in different states, countries, provinces, where there's lack of access, uh, typically the wildlife gets hosed. Um, so access is a big one. Uh, uh, education of the public, both in the form of educating them to be ethical, uh, if they're hunters and anglers, backpackers, any kind of outdoor recreation, or education on doing that safely, again, because if they're not doing it, how are they going to care? And then advocacy uh, for conservation causes. Any of those four things, you know, the obvious sexy work that Ben does, uh, and the Sheep Society does with collars and all that, but then everything kind of down the line from there. Uh, if a business is engaging in that, we count that. And at the end of the year, we go through their, their books, make sure that it's all squared away. We keep it as painless as possible so they're not doing super hard taxes a second time. And we keep them in the fold that way, giving back to conservation as their business grows. Or in some cases, like in this year, we did have some businesses that shrunk because of the pandemic. A percentage is still a percentage. So whether your business exploded this year, like so many outdoor businesses did, most of the outdoor industry businesses are doing quite well because a lot of people are going outside. Um, but, you know, if their businesses grew, that's more going to conservation. If their businesses shrunk, they're still able to give back because it's a percentage. Fantastic, Jared. So um, let's just bounce back slightly to the individual. So I, I yeah. want to sign up. Let's say I want to do it what do I have to do? Like, uh, I know what I, what's required, but what, how does that work if I want to sign up? Yeah. So you just go to our website, which you can Google us 2% for conservation, or you can go to fishandwildlife.org. Uh, and if English is not your first language, though I'm assuming everyone listening to this is, but if French is, uh, it will auto translate for you. So don't worry about that. Uh, and there is a web page there, uh, and it says individual certification. And you click on that and it's super straightforward. You put where, you know, you write down where you're giving your time and dollars. We do ask that folks, folks not use acronyms. We do know what WSSBC is, um, you know, Wild Sheep Society of British Columbia, but we don't know what all of these acronyms are. So if you could put in, you know, where you put your time, where you put your dollars and that you commit to continuing to do that. That's, that's another piece. We don't make individual members re-up every year. We want to, once, once they're members, the only stuff they get from us in email or social media has to do with opportunities to give back or opportunities to support businesses that are giving back. Uh, people don't get a, from our partners at such and such email. They get a, this is how this business just has been giving back. By the way, there's a discount with them right now for individual members, uh, should you be interested. Um, for an individual, it's super, super straightforward. Then we do a little bit of a review. So I said it's honor system, but with social media, we can tell if someone's a, a skunk a little bit. Um, and, and from time to time, we have caught a couple chuckleheads. Uh, trying to take advantage of it, uh, who have no interest in wildlife conservation whatsoever. Um, I think we've caught six to date. So in general, folks are being pretty good. We do a little bit of a review, so it can take a week or two. Uh, but once once we've reviewed, we'll set, you'll get an email in your inbox saying, you know, welcome aboard. Here's your discount code that you can use on 2% stuff. Um, and then from then on, the communication that you're getting from us uh, has to do with opportunities and we try uh, to really only make it be regional unless there's kind of an international or, or, or larger scale opportunity to engage something. So for Canadian members, you're not receiving, here's a volunteer opportunity in Montana. Um, we will, you know, if, if, if the society says we need some volunteers to show up and they send us a note with that, or one of our business members up in Canada says, hey, we've got an opportunity near Calgary. We'd love to have other volunteers come and join us. We'll hit folks in that area with, uh, you know, geotagged, here's a chance to give back in your area. Or, uh, like I said, stories about how a business in their area gave back. 
um, that they can that they can then engage with. Fantastic. Yeah, you know, I, I I signed up. I heard you. I think on the Journal of Mountain Hunting, um, and you're on the podcast mm-hmm. with Adam. And the second I heard about it, um, and I think most of my friends uh, are are now certified for sure. So. Just, it's an honor to be affiliated with 2%, and just something I believe strongly in, and just the work you're doing, Jared, is fantastic. So, um, so there's the business side of things, too, and, and if you're good with that, I'm going to jump over to Ben and let Ben talk about that experience about becoming certified. So, um, Ben, maybe just give us an overview of your work with Canadian Wildlife Capture. I know you're the president. Talk a little bit about what you do for the company, and then um, maybe a little bit about the certification process. I know you said you learned about 2% at the Jurassic Classic, but uh, just how that evolved, how long it took, and what was involved with the process. Sure, sure. Um, So as far as Canadian Wildlife Capture and my role there, um, like I say, I formed it in 2012, and uh, as a pilot, I was the uh, sole pilot um, out there, and I was acquiring contracts, mostly provincial government contracts, to capture animals from the helicopter, for the reason of hell sampling and deploying GPS collars. The, G- the GPS collars are for a variety of reasons. Uh, sometimes it's for population estimates or uh, range use, uh, migration, um, predator prey interactions. Um, and it just kind of grew from there. Uh, and today we've got, um, including myself, three pilots, we've got six net gunners, and we're out there, our, our busy season would be from December 1st. Maybe that's even growing now because we've got a helicopter going out next week. Um, but primarily our busiest season's December 1st to April the 1st. That's sort of our winter season, which is beneficial for capturing animals because of snow, for tracking them, or also uh, it's outside hunting season generally. And the snow also cushions their falls and the cooler temperatures um, help with their, their temperatures. So they keep cool temperatures when we're chasing them and a little bit of a stressful event for the animals, of course, uh, but for the greater good. Um, so that's kind of how it kind of evolved. And, you know, we just always, I just kept the same, uh, the, the, the same notion that we're just out there helping people out and we're just doing what we can and it's good people doing good things. And, you know, I've had some struggles along the way. We've hired, I've hired, tried to hire helicopter pilots, you know, real pilots, the guys that uh, just want a paycheck and they weren't real passionate about the task at hand and, and the task of uh, just helping the biologists get the job done. And it never really turned out. So I've been fortunate enough to meet some fantastic people and the net gunners we got out there and the pilots that we've got now are absolutely like fantastic people. And they're just, they, they have the same objective of just helping out and I always have this you know I tell people like what else could you ask for in life if as long as you're you know you're making a comfortable living you have a house you know a roof over your head what is else is there to life right there's uh you got to do something more and just do what we can yeah help out any any kind of groups or the the people with the same objectives and you know so we can pass that on to our kids our grandkids and you know, hundred years down the road, we still got some wild places and some wildlife out there. Yeah. So that's Canadian wildlife capture and it's just been growing ever since. And I keep on thinking, uh, as it grows, it's just more management, which takes away from, uh, from me being out in the bush, but I still, I'm still out there. So we've been able to, as long as we've got good people doing good stuff out there, it allows me still to be out, out there myself too. And so, with 2% for conservation, yeah, like I said, I met Jared at the Jurassic Classic last year, 2019, and it kind of piqued my interest because I was like, what's this all about? You know, 2% for conservation and automatically, I think my brain went to, you want 2% of uh, gross income <laughs> to, 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 to go to whatever you decide is uh, some conservation, and that's not what it's about at all. Um, it's like Jared was just explaining, it's 1% of your gross income to a, or a group or an organization, a conservation organization, or whatever you decide is, is on the same page as you as far as conservation. So you could pick whether it's, uh, you know, you're taking, you're, uh, maybe it's a donation, direct donation for 
possibly a land conservation uh, initiative, or if you're doing uh, business, like for us, it's fairly easy because Wild Sheep Society lately has been doing, um, uh, working on some health monitoring uh, with sheep. So, wow, we've got to go out there and capture them. So it's easy. It's like, here, we'll, we'll do it for as low as we, you know, as cheap as we can without like losing our shirt and not being able to buy groceries. So um, you could do, you could, people can do that that's for sure or uh, anything that they decide that they would that they could uh give money to or uh time to as well and then the one percent of your time well that's pretty easy because everybody's always donating their time for stuff but it's that certification is pretty it's pretty neat because it says hey i'm committed to doing this uh, you know i've got a business but we want to we want to work towards an initiative that's for the greater good of wildlife and uh, wild places and, and, and just general conservation of those things. Um, so the process was easy. I just uh, emailed Jared and he sent me a, a package that contained all the stuff that we need to get started. Uh, as far as just like a business logo, what's expected, the financial stuff, that's super easy. Uh, you know, I, I have an accountant, take a snapshot of that with my camera, send that to him, super, super easy. For sure, and so anybody you know that's listening, possible, possibly, um, you know, if they're thinking about to present for conservation, yeah, don't let the effort, you know, uh, shy you away from it. That's for sure. It's really, it's really simple. Get older, Jared, and, um, and he'll send you all the information. And um, what else can I say about that? Uh, yeah, and how long did the process take? Um, I'm going to say probably about four months, I guess, but you know, Jared and I, we kind of like loosely emailed back and forth and it was like, yeah, hey, did you it was know, middle of COVID. Like junk, junk mail there somewhere. Cause I emailed you about a month ago. And so, <laughs> yeah, so their, their situation was a little unique cause, uh, it happened right in the middle of the pandemic shutdown. And we were also in the middle of a website port over. So a whole ton of businesses emails ended up all going to a server that didn't exist anymore. So they, they were part of that. We had about a dozen businesses go through that. Typically it is about a month is what we try to keep it to reviewing. Some of the stuff can take a little bit longer, especially for, we just like, we brought on uh, an Australian business last month uh, that also works with, they're a wildlife consulting business. And to review the laws, um, there are, are different laws when it comes to what is a legal entity for a business in different places. And we have to do all that stuff on this back end. So like we had one business come on a week ago and it took 48 hours. You know, um, but then, you know, we have others where we have to really review what they do and it takes, it takes a bit longer. And, and some of the international ones in particular where I'm having to use Google Translate uh, and type over, we have a couple we're working on right now in Eastern Europe that I am having to literally type from a photo using characters that are not uh, alphanumeric. <laughs> Uh, to then figure out what their paperwork is actually saying. Um, that can take a little longer. But for you guys, it was screw-ups on our part. That was, that was entirely our fault that it took four months, and I'm, I'm still, still a little chapped about that. That's, that's about usually the pace that I move at there, <laughs> as far as paperwork goes. Yeah, it usually it takes a bit of a backseat there and there, but uh, <laughs> the end game's all the same. Get her done. So yeah. <laughs> Can you uh, talk a little bit about, um, you know, the type of work uh, Canadian Wildlife Capture is doing? I know it's capture work and, and stuff, but what kind of, uh, so who are you supporting? What, what projects, who are you working for? You can talk about some of your contracts and, and the kind of work that you guys do uh, do there. Sure. Um, so, oh boy, we got a lot of projects on the go. Uh, sheep related stuff, uh, I can, maybe I can touch on first. So we're working on the Fraser River, Fraser River Health Monitoring, which is the California bighorn sheep population along the Fraser River, which historically, I, I think it's, so, it's been up as high as about 1,300 animals. And then in recent years, it's just been on this slow, steady decline. And I think the population's sitting at about 
500 animals, possibly maybe a little bit higher. And that's along a stretch of river uh, from Lillooet to Williams Lake, which I'm going to kind of take a, a guesstimate. Maybe that's 100 miles, 150 miles, 300 kilometers, somewhere in that neighborhood. The, the sheep primarily live along the river banks going from uh, the river and then up the hills uh, approximately 2,000 feet. So they, they, they a fairly small area. Um, and what's happened there is uh, low recruitment has caused the decline of population. And so we've got a lot of adult sheep out there that are 10, 8 to 12 years old kind of thing, and there's no young ones. And what's been limiting that recruitment is moldy. And so I think I'm going to, I can't remember the exact year, but there was a sheep, a domestic sheep farmer, a bit of a hobby farmer, came into the valley it's maybe 10 years ago now, somewhere around there. And the biologists have an exact date, but that's where the mulvey originated from. And then it spread through the entire population. And so it wasn't known until two years ago, if that's what was causing the decline and the low recruitment, but it was, it was kind of anticipated and expected. And so we went through with uh, funding from Wild Sheep Society of BC and all the members to do a health monitoring. So we did the southern half of the valley first, did a bunch of captures, did a bunch of sampling, did a bunch of collars uh, to track some movements and connectivity. Uh, and it came back that about 10% of the population had actively, they were actively shedders of moldy. Um, so the following year, we did the northern half and same results. And a lot of those subpopulations, uh, you know, the small groups, 30 to 50 animals maybe would live between two uh, major tributaries to the Fraser River. Some of them haven't had lamb survival for several years. And so that's where we get that old, older age class animals. And then as those older animals die off, well, there's nothing, just nothing taken in place. So uh, last year, uh, we were able to help out on a bit of a, uh, an action plan to, you know, what are we going to do to, to fix this? It's over 150 odd miles, 200 miles of river. How do you treat this? How do you get rid of Moby? And so down in the States, it was used as an example, Hell's Canyon. And then there was also one in, I think, North Dakota, maybe somewhere where they, where they were able to remove actively shedding sheep uh they capture them test them on site active and remove those ones and over time they 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 were able to get rid of moby so on that the guys at bc along with wild sheep society a lot of other people involved um, and of course the funding through all the members it was all funded by by volunteers and by the members of wild sheep society wild sheep foundation um we went out there and we, we caught a subpopulation. So roughly 50 animals in a subpopulation in between these two major draws. The caller data from the couple of years prior kind of proved that fact that those sheep don't really move outside that area. So we were able to go in there, capture every single animal. I shouldn't say every single one. We didn't, we didn't focus on any rams, although we, got, we did get some young rams uh, just because they hang out with the lambs and ewes. But we were able to, on the site test each individual animal and the ones that came and tested positive for actively shedding the moby subsequently removed those ones which was roughly around that 10 percent number and uh let the other ones go and so we'll see this this summer uh there was lots of lambs born and i understand that there was you know definitely some lambs that survived so far i haven't heard the latest numbers from the september recruitment survey um, which was all done by volunteers on the ground, Wild Sheep Society members. Um, but hopefully that, that, that's going to help out. Moving forward, just talk, talk, talking about that particular project. Um, you know, if, we, if, we have, if there is success, much like they've seen down in Hills Canyon, down in uh, the States there, um, 
I, I think that, that that's definitely awesome, you know, and I mean, over time, it, it would cost a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort to do the whole entire Fraser River. Um, but where do we go from there? There's, in BC, there's still no regulation. There's still no registry for any kind of hobby sheep farmers. There's nothing to prevent people from bringing domestic sheep into those areas. And that's where I think through the, you know, yourself, Kyle, and the rest of the Wild Sheep Society, you know, definitely pushing for some sort of regulation to, or registry to prove that your, your domestic sheep are moldy free or to prevent people from having domestic sheep in wild sheep habitats. And I think that that's gotta be a big focus because it, it, it is a, a, you know, all the volunteer hours, all the volunteer funding, everything could be lost in just, you know, a split second from um, somebody bringing domestic sheep in there. And of course the people, wild sheep people, are all on the same page and it seems like pretty common sense, but there's a lot of people out there that'd be like, yeah, I'm gonna get a couple of sheep today and I'll just raise those. And it doesn't matter if there's wild sheep around, they don't really, they don't have the same, um, the same outlook, that's for sure. So that's the, the Fraser River project. Also, we've been working on a similar type thing there uh, in, um, I guess somewhat similarities uh, in the Okanagan, there's been a Seropteus outbreak, which is a, a parasitic mite that's affecting the wild sheep, but it doesn't really kill the sheep, uh, but it, it infects them by, uh, it, it, it's a, like a, a sub-microscopic mite and it, it attacks their, their skin and it, it creates like a crusting of the ears and it causes hair loss. And like I say, it doesn't kill the sheep, but it, it sort of degrades their, um, their, their, their feeding habit, habits and they spend a lot of the time just scratching themselves, itching themselves, their ears plug up, they lose their hearing, they become more susceptible to predation and usually that's what the end causes is, is predation from cougars or wolves. So we've been working on that in the, uh, the west side of the Okanagan Valley, Ashnola. So that's been like a six year project. Uh, they're still trying to find some kind of drug that we'll be able to administer either by capture and then doing it or maybe an aerial one, but they haven't found one that's worked. So we did some projects where we did some penning, different drug trials and stuff, but did nothing's really come out of it yet. And what else we've been working on? I think that's pretty much it for sheep, although there has been another outbreak recently in the Southern Okanagan on the east side of the Valley of Mulvey. That one, um, there's a, some, a group of sheep there go back and forth, but across the, the US border. And someone, some sheep there, probably rams picked up Mulvey from a, there's a domestic sheep farm down in the States there. So they come up and it's infected the group. That same group of sheep uh, had a Mulvey outbreak, I think in 1995, uh, a pneumonia outbreak as well. So uh, yeah, tough times for sheep. They definitely have lots of disease issues. So um, aside from sheep, pro oh yeah, go ahead, go. Yeah, Ben, I was just going to say, so you're, you're like, you obviously are a huge supporter of the society. Can you talk about the, the other entities? Like what other groups are, is it, does all your support go to the Wild Sheep Society of BC, but I think you're either supporting other organizations as well through your 2% certification. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's mostly been through Wild Sheep Society uh, recently, but also uh, Life Member, Wild Sheep Foundation, Rocky Mountain Gold Alliance, um, the Wild Sheep Foundation, Yukon Chapter, Alberta Chapter, um, also BC Wildlife Federation. Uh, what else? There's probably a few more I'm forgetting about. Nature Trust of BC, you know, I'm a big advocate of that. Donate whenever I can to uh, different uh, land purchases, like just more, just like the one that Wild Sheep Society has been part of with uh, the Southern Interior Land Trust, those Granby land acquisitions. It's kind of a, you know, it's almost an urban property, I guess you could say, if you can call it that, but it's fairly close to some uh, urban areas, but very important for mule deer, those California bighorn sheep populations there that are just outside Grand Forks and definitely a, 
uh, a great property. So I donate to that. Um, I don't know. There's probably a bunch of stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. You're always involved. No, for sure. And um, so that Jared, that all works ties in. You don't have to, you can, you can donate to a number of groups. Uh, there's no real one that you have to designate or anything right. like that. Is my understanding. Right. And, and those memberships count too. So, you know, if you, if you buy an annual membership for yourself or, or employees of your business, um, we have a couple business members that actually incentivize employee performance by, hey, we will buy a, a, a membership to the conservation organization of your choosing if you hit these different, you know, employee objectives. Some of them, uh, Sitka, they gamified uh, uh, paid days for volunteering. Uh, if you hit different performance you know, KPIs, your, your key performance indicators. If you hit different ones over the course of the year, you get first dibs on going and putting in a sheep guzzler in Nevada or going on a, a sheep capture project and getting to be a volunteer and get paid for the day, you know, going and doing it. So there's, there's lots of fun ways that you can integrate the certification, not just for marketing purposes to potential customers, but also internally uh, with your own employees. Fantastic. So, um, somebody's two percent certified. Uh, what's um, can you talk about your committee members? What's involved with that? Let's say somebody wants to do a little bit more and get a little bit more involved with two percent. What does that look like? So, uh, one thing I discovered very quickly uh, as two percent started to grow, uh, kind of outside the Rockies, was it was difficult for us to find causes and vet causes for businesses to give back to. Uh, we've got members, like I said, all over the world um and and becoming more so for us to say yes that's a good conservation group that's a real conservation group nope that one's actually a political action group posing as a concept you know for us to understand those different things is just impossible uh to to run for any one group of people to just under you know a small group of people to understand so uh in january of 2019 we started a committee program and these folks go through about the same amount of vetting, maybe a little bit more even, uh, than some of our business members for coming in. And what they are are point people. So in BC, uh, there's actually two Sheep Society committee members who uh, joined us straight out of the gate, uh, Trevor Carruthers and Naomi Weeks. And uh, for both of them, reviewing what they did was super easy. Uh, for each one of them, they go through a vetting process. What organizations do you work with? Uh, what level of involvement do you have with them? Are you just a member? Are you, do you have a title? Are you, are you in leadership with them? Uh, and then there's, uh, they have to provide references. Uh, not like my mom says I'm cool, but like, you know, references within an organization or, or within local fish and game. Something to say, hey, this person is a good point of contact. That way, when a business calls and says, we want to get certified, we're not giving back anywhere right now. We don't know where to give, uh, but we're interested in these things. We can at least get them in touch with someone in an area and say, all right, well, this folks work, these, these folks work with this, this, and this, uh, or they know all the people uh, in a region. So we have a couple committee members who don't hold titled positions, but they know the local chapter president of XYZ org. They know the the local lead biologist. They know all these, you know, and we vetted them for that. We then put them in touch with that business that is is right near them or, or wanting to work near them or work with what they work with. And it just facilitates a real world relationship. And we're not playing, you know, middleman on that anymore. Or what was really happening was I was the pinch in the funnel. Uh, for folks giving back because I'm sitting there doing aggressive Googling and trying to figure out who these different organizations are in Kentucky and Scotland and all over the place. Um, so that's what that program is. And if someone's interested in joining that, uh, we, like I said, we just need to know who you're involved with and how you will help a business give back, how you will be a good point of contact if a business wants to work with fish, with birds, with land, with um, you know, you name it, anything in the ecosystem, how will you help them do that? And there are some perks to it. Um, it's not why folks get involved. We're, we're really proud of our committee program. There's about 70 of them uh, around the U.S. and Canada right now with a few coming on in some other countries. 
but that vetting's taking a little bit longer uh, just to make sure that if someone says, I want to give back in this country, that we're actually facilitating that, um, that they're going to have a good experience. Um, but parts of, uh, of parts of being with it, there is like a, a referral perk. It's not a, it's not a requirement for committee members to bring in new businesses. Uh, it's not a sales position for 2%. It's not anything like that. It's, it's vetted folks uh, to help individuals and businesses give back. So even individuals, like let's say you have a family, your family, you, you have some funds to give or just yourself. Uh, you know, you, you had a, a good year and you want to give back a little more. Um, you can go right on our website. It's on our team page. You can click on committee program. It's also, it's linked in a ton of places. So it's easy for folks to find. But there's a map of where committee members are. You click on the pin, shows their name, shows their phone number, shows their email. You can get right in touch with them and say, where can I, how can I give back in your area? It also says who they work with and who they volunteer with. So you can understand uh, that aspect. I think uh, between all of them, and we don't have them all up on the website right now because we're a little backlogged because of how aggressively we, we vet them. Uh, there's over 100 organizations across uh, North America that they're involved with that folks can tap into and start giving back through. So uh, if, if we had a Wild Sheep Society BC member that maybe wants to get 2% certified, do they maybe mm -hmm. reach out to the uh, committee member? Do they reach out to the office? Do you directly? Or how, what would you recommend? Direct to us would probably be best. So the committee members don't do the certifying. Uh, we are super, super um, strict on confidentiality for business members. Uh, we run hyper encrypted emails. Uh, we're running VPNs all the time. It might be saying on Zoom right now that I'm in a different state than I'm in. Uh, we, we just really protect our members' data. Um, in fact, we, I'm running Zoom over a browser window right now for the tech savvy uh, video services can sometimes uh, pull data outside of your computer. So we're super strict on that because we know our businesses, that's their private financial data. So for committee members, we don't have them handle that. It's either myself uh, or our member coordinator, Calvin Farinato, uh, or both of us together if it's a pretty big business and we have to do a lot of vetting. Um, so we just have them get in touch directly with us. We set up, uh, we always do a phone call or a video conference, whichever folks prefer. Uh, we keep it for international members. You're not paying an international phone charge. We have a, a free line that you can call into or, or web browse into. Um, and we work with you and go through what are your goals as a company? Uh, what are you passionate about as a company? What are your employees passionate about? Uh, we just brought on a company that the owner hunts, super passionate about hunting certain big game species. None of his employees hunt couple of them fish, uh, but the rest are backpackers, rock climbers, um, or, you know, sit on the back porch like my mom and watch birds and they're passionate about those things. So we helped them come up with, again, we don't tell people where they have to give, but we gave them kind of a menu of, of, of different organizations that work in those things. And then they had their company retreat uh, actually two weeks ago and they'll be getting back to us this next week. Which, are, which of these orgs do they want to be involved with? Uh, and that way it's something that the, the whole company has ownership over and we're as hands-on as a business wants or as hands-off uh, with, you know, the exception of the, the aggressive background work we do on the financials to ensure a business has actually given back the way that they say they've given back. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Jared. So one question that I've always uh, wondered about, and I've heard you talk a little bit about it is, uh, the funding model for 2%. Now, I know you got some seed money from some big companies, Sitka, um, I think Wall Street Foundation was involved, that there was some seed money there, but um, I, I, I'm certified, I've, I've sent you nothing in terms of money. Right. So how does that work for your funding model for 2%? Yeah, so that, I think that's part of why uh, Randy sent me to the to the meeting to apply, because he knows I'm a sucker for punishment. Um, <laughs> our funding model is weird. <laughs> uh, we have a, a, a directive within the organization and I doubled down on it when I took over to anywhere we can not compete with conservation groups for funding uh, to ensure that dollars are going there. That said, we do have to operate. 
Um, I was, when I first came on, I was part-time. And the growth rate that 2% was, was moving towards just could not it needed someone to be full time. Um, and at the time my wife did not work. Uh, now she does, uh, partly because of 2% funding model. Uh, we publish all of our financials at the end of the year, including employee payroll. So folks know exactly what I make. They know what our member coordinator makes and whatnot. So backstory, the wild sheep foundation, Sitka gear, uh, and the Rocky mountain elk foundation provided us with seed dollars, basically enough operating funds to run for our first two and a half to three years. Uh, and we used the bulk of those dollars, uh, when we first launched, which weren't huge when you, when you look at, I mean, it was generous on their parts, but when you look at what it takes to start a conservation group kind of out of nothing was not, uh, uh as significant as some other groups receive. Um, uh, but we're now outside of that, outside of those original seed dollars. And what we operate on now is almost exclusively uh, business member dues. So business members are the only ones of our members who do pay into being a member of 2%. We have scaled our business members to match, have their dues match what they would be paying for another, any other accreditation org. So uh, both in the US and Canada, there's the Better Business Bureau. We modeled our dues off of theirs. So it, you know, small businesses, the smallest businesses will pay about 300 a year. Uh, now in Canada, you'll pay less because we let you pay 300 Canadian, not 300 US. Now, if that goes to the inverse, then you would just pay 300 Canadian, not you. Um, but the smallest businesses pay that amount per year to be a member. And then it scales up with the size of business. Ultimately, when we reach a certain member number, when we get to a number where we can operate in this new way, we will cap everyone's dues dollars at a very low rate. When we get to a size to where we can operate um, and continue to scale, we will cap everyone's dollars at some of the, at, at the board is still deciding which lower tier we'll cap at. They're trying to protect me from myself a little bit in that, uh, cause I, I'd like to do it soon. Uh, but reality says we can't do that yet. Um, Ultimately, that's, that's how we'll do it. We do have a couple other funding mechanisms. Uh, we have a license plate in Montana uh, where when someone gets a, a license plate with our design on it, we get 25 bucks. Um, and that actually right now uh, covers a good chunk of our member coordinators uh, role with us. Uh, we started that program because I needed help uh, and because we wanted to have more facilitation between conservation groups and businesses uh, more than we already had. So beyond the certification, to actually be hands-on with helping conservation groups work together, helping businesses partner together. Uh, we believe in the free market, but we we say conservation's not a competition. So you know, having having competing businesses work together takes a lot of person hours, worker hours to make happen. So we started that license plate program here in Montana. Um, we may go after some grants. Honestly, our workload is like this right now and our capacity is like this and that's with us working around the clock. I, I quit working last night, I think at about eight o'clock uh, and I start every morning around seven. Um, and the work is there. There is so much work to be done and there are so many folks eager to do it. That's the exciting part and why I'm just happy to do it is I'm helping with these relationships just do good things. Um, not breaking up fights, not dealing with policy fights, not those, I don't have to do those things that other conservation orgs are always, you know, having to do. I can partner different businesses with these groups to make those relationships even move a little better. So we may be going after some grants, but we're not going to go after outdoor grants. Uh, we're not going to go after funding that other conservation groups could go after. And it's, a hard line and there are some days where I second and triple guess myself on that but I put it into our bylaws when I was hired on for a reason at no point do I want organizations thinking we're coming for their bacon uh, it's already a competitive enough and and in many ways in a bad way um, competitive enough space there are so few resources going to to the need compared to what the actual need is um, that any way that we can take ourselves out of that market 
and and just help push more dollars in there that's what we try to do so uh, it's dues dollars and a license plate right now and some product sales we've got a limited run t-shirt right now uh, <laughs> But we're not, we're not a t-shirt bumper sticker org. We try to keep things super limited there too. And even try to schedule the release of our products if we have new logo gear so that we're not competing with other orgs new logo gear at the same time, which as we grow is becoming harder and harder to do as that calendar fills up as we become more cognizant of what other, other orgs are trying to do around the world, so. Oh, fantastic. You know, it's interesting you said, uh, uh, people doing good things and uh, Ben always says good people doing good things uh, that's been his model yeah. since I've known him um, the, the first time I spoke to him on the phone that's exactly what he said and uh, it's uh, cool to hear you say that so yeah fantastic uh, Jared just appreciate everything 2% does for conservation and uh, you guys truly are a giving organization it's you know I'm honored to be affiliated with you guys as a member uh, individual member so fantastic so obviously COVID's a messed up year. 2020 is a train wreck. Um, and I love your messaging. I love 2%'s messaging around, uh, you know, volunteers, um, all the stuff you guys stand for, you know, conservation is not competition. All the things I believe in, you guys are always saying that. So um, what can people do in this year? 2020 is a train wreck. Um, how can people support conservation? What, what do we need to do to, to keep on track here? So uh, biggest thing we've seen this year, Bigger, the, the, the trend that I find most concerning, I'll put it that way, the trend that I personally, in working with all these different conservation groups, all the different businesses that support them, all these different volunteers that support them, um, biggest trend I find most concerning is the burnout of volunteer leaders. And it is at a scale that is, um, I mean, it's alarming. Uh, hard to describe without taking a whole lot of time on it. Uh, and it, what it really comes down to though is, is the, you know, what would be called the 80, 20 or the 90, 10. Uh, I call it the 99 and one rule where you've got 1% of the people doing 99% of the work. If there was one thing I could hope for in this year that we would address culturally, especially in the hunting world, um, where we're directly benefiting from the work being done by conservation groups in a way that's a bit more substantial than someone who goes on a hike. Um, I'm not devaluing the, uh, you know, someone seeing a sheep and just having an awesome experience from seeing some sheep, uh, but a hunter's typically, uh, you know, receiving more. Um, we, we've got to, we've got to have higher buy-in uh, on, on taking care of the resource. And we have to, step away, and this is part of why 2% was founded. Um, we, we need to step away from, well, other folks can fix it, to I've got to fix it. I've got to do my part to fix it. I've got to do my part to help with these programs. You know, uh, listening to Ben talk about the different projects, we have very similar things here in the States going on, and it is just, it bugs the hell out of me when I hear a hunter go, well, I buy my tags, it's good enough. No, if you call yourself a conservationist because you buy a hunting tag in the U.S. and there's an excise tax on it, you, you're okay with participation trophies, apparently. And that's what you see the title of conservationist as um, when you buy that tag. Uh, just, be, you know, if, if that's the case, uh, then because I pay property tax, I might, must also be an educator because uh, property tax goes to the local, my kid's school, right? It, it doesn't make sense. Um, hunting is a conservation tool. It's not the end all to conservation. We need buy-in. And this year seeing volunteers just get ran ragged trying to support organizations. I mean, you guys know better than most. Yours was one of the first, I think it was the second banquet I heard of getting canceled uh, because of, of the pandemic. Um, I actually picked up COVID at Sheep Show. <laughs> like, you know, so with, with everything that happened with events and the cancellations and trying to figure out what do we do, you, you have volunteers, people with normal jobs, people, people with everyday jobs trying to figure out how do we cover the cost of these venues that we had reserved? How do we, what, what do we do with all these products that were donated to us, these hunts that were donated to us, these trips that were donated to us? What, how do we take care of all this? And it's folks doing that in their free time, their family time, their personal time trying to figure that out 
during a year that is something special. Um, you know, uh, 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 there are different times in history that kind of are similar to it, and there have certainly been harder times in history. But what we're trying to do at the same time is a lot to ask of a very small percentage of people. So if there is one thing, you know, I'm looking at is we just need more buy-in. We need more businesses partnering with conservation groups and saying, hey, we got you. We got your back. We be my employees benefit, whether you're a construction, we've got construction companies that are certified here in the States. Uh, whatever your business is, we have, we have consultants, we have accountants, we have real estate agents. Actually, uh, we just certified a, a BC one uh, last week. Uh, she doesn't know that though yet, and you all know who she is, so you'll have to watch for that announcement. But uh, uh, you know, whatever your business is, understanding that there has to be personal buy-in, or the whole reason for you living where you live, and the things that your employees enjoy where you live, could be gone from that lack of funding and from the volunteers falling off. We've asked so much of folks like y'all, put on these big shows for us, because you know you've got it in the goodness of your heart to help us all drink a bunch and then you know buy a time you know buy a timeshare uh, vacation at an auction you know like we look at that and then we look at the actual needs on the landscape in present world it doesn't work it just doesn't work to have uh 20 to 30 people typically running all this fundraising in all these different regions for all these different species and it's around the world i'm getting calls every day messages every day uh from folks who are getting tired and 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 folks who are getting discouraged uh because folks are not stepping up and yeah it's a hard year but you know to anyone who's like hey this is this has been a crazy year it's been the same for the volunteers too and yet they've stuck to it and they've continued so you know one percent of your time 21 hours that's that's less than two hours per month over the course of a year. If you committed an hour and a half a month, it would have a massive impact in your local area like you wouldn't believe. Even if that hour and a half is calling these other conservation leaders and saying, how you doing? You know, uh, who ended up paying for that lost deposit on the hotel that we were gonna have our, our, our event at? Because that happened. Um, there were, we did an accounting of all the different canceled conservation fundraising events as best we could. Uh, we ended up being contacted by some folks in, in the federal government here in the U.S. Hey, do you guys happen to know how many dollars were missed out on? Um, and it was catastrophic. But what I'm more concerned about, because those dollars will end up being found and, and some, of the, some of the work will still end up being done. It's just going to be more lean. What I'm more concerned about is who ended up paying the bill. Uh, for all those rented Holiday Inns, you know, where the banquets were supposed to happen. What I found, uh, what we found uh, through our committee program as well, is it was a lot of people out of their personal finances covering those costs during a pandemic, losing their jobs, still taking it on. So if I can ask folks to do one thing, find out, call, call the group that does the stuff that you care about, Maybe you've been a member for years. Maybe you've gone to the banquets for years. Call and ask, how you doing? Start with that. Maybe not like, what can I do? Because frankly, the volunteer leaders are so strapped in, they don't even know. And, and within the big conservation groups, there's been so much turnover because of loss of employees, because of loss of funding, um, that a lot of times they don't know where to put you, you know, if you want to help out. But if you just call and start with, how's it going? Are there any projects coming up? Here's a need I saw. How can I go about it myself? And I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll reiterate it. They may not have an answer because it's been that crazy of a year. But starting somewhere and just dedicating an hour a month, you know, go for half of our, our little, little over half of our requirement on time, an hour a month to try to find out what you can do in your area. It's, we're we're going to be seeing the ramifications of 2020 down the road for quite a while, both from the loss of loss of projects and loss of dollars raised at these events. So um, any way that you can do that, that, that is a solution to, I mean, it's not a silver bullet because it's going to be unique in every single region of the world, but it is something that will at least get the, the needle moving in the right direction for the things you care about.
Yeah, that that's sage advice for sure, um, uh, Jared. Uh, fantastic, and uh, yeah, in BC here we had our event canceled as you mentioned in Kamloops, and uh, our members stepped up big time. Uh, we we did have a bill. Sadly, uh, the hotel was willing to work with us, but we were already on location. We had catering paid for everything, and they they whittled the bill down to what they could, but it was still sizable. And uh, our yeah. members stepped up big time. They said, "Keep our dues." Uh, there was so many that did that and um you know a lot of people converted uh, a bunch of money that they uh had allocated to the convention to memberships that sort of stuff yep. so uh yeah for sure so no excellent advice for sure jared and i i just have to say uh personally from my perspective all that you guys do at two percent uh and you personally the hours you put in and the effort you put in uh and i know conservation work is not when you go to um to get rich uh for sure so you know it's definitely a, a pursuit of passion it's not one that you're gonna uh, get rich off so I, i'm so thankful for everything that you do um and and all the work that two percent does and what you guys stand for something I, it means a lot to me and i'm really really thankful for everything you guys have there so thank you yeah. thank you steve do you have anything you want to touch on before we wrap up no it's been uh pretty pretty informational i met jared down in reno and now that i know you had covid i'm glad i brought hand sanitizer <laughs> no so, i picked uh, it up there yeah that's, uh, <laughs> that's that's not good you, you seem to be doing good but uh yeah it's it's, it's been good I'm, I'm certified and to, to reiterate it literally took five minutes to get personally certified uh naomi introduced me and here i am today yeah fantastic program and uh just to, to flip back, Ben, I want to thank you for your dedication to our, our organization. Um, you're always the first to step up. Um, you, you've you've uh, donated your time, your money, your effort um, at all our events. Um, I know through the Jurassic Classic, uh, you uh, through Canadian Wildlife Capture, you bring teams, your regional bios are there every year. And that's always a great addition to our event. It's always fun to have the bios there and talking about the projects we're doing. So we're super thankful for that, Ben. And uh, but I know it all goes beyond that. Uh, the first guy to stand up, step up for the Granby uh, land purchase was you. Um, a huge donation there for that land purchase. So it's not, it's not just that, oh, I'll give you some, you know, cut on my business. You're doing it outside the box. You're giving real dollars to conservation. So you're truly uh, an inspiration for our organization. I'm really thankful for all you do um, to support the society and conservation organizations across the board. So thanks, Ben. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, and I sure appreciate everything you guys do, right? It's man, it's huge. It's huge volunteer doll, uh, uh, time and effort and yeah, your own dollars too. And just like Jared said, like if there's anybody out there that is uh, thinking about what they can do for conservation, what can they do? Just like Jared was just saying, plant that seed today, plant it. And you, you just, you'll, you'll see it grow over time. Once you just get the, your foot in the door and plant that seed, it's amazing what it can grow into. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic advice, Ben. Appreciate it. And uh, Jared, thank you. Keep on uh, the great work. And uh, we're definitely going to be uh, continue to push what you guys are doing there. Just uh, thanks so much for the support you give our conservation community and your leadership. Um, so we'll wrap this up, gentlemen. Uh, I appreciate the time you guys took a couple hours out of your day today. And uh, but really important uh, comments you had on the, the podcast through Zoomcast. So thank you.